And now here is the year's short story winner, Femi Aguda, reading from Masquerade Season. Hello, my name is Femi Aguda, and I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my short story, Masquerade Season. The masquerades are swishing in the corner of the living room, between the old TV with the crooked antenna and the heat-trapping velvet curtains that Polly's mother keeps forgetting to replace. The masquerades are so bright, too bright maybe, for the otherwise dim apartment, and Polly is seated on the edge of the sofa, sometimes has to look away, afraid his eyes will rupture from color. It wasn't hard getting the masquerades home. They moved through the bush without problems, hopped over the gate gracefully, as if they were feather light. When the Alley Lake security guards had seen Polly and the masquerades approaching, they waved and asked, and what do we have here? To which Polly replied, these are my masquerades. And the masquerades had swayed, and Polly liked the way the guards nodded, touched their cap visors to show they were impressed. His mother has warned him not to bring strangers home, yes. So in this second thing, Polly is a disobedient son. But he's sure she will understand that masquerades aren't things you pass up, especially when they belong to you. And isn't, his, isn't it his mother who always says never to leave his belongings lying around, never to lose them? Polly doesn't know what appropriate conversation with masquerades sound like. Should he ask where they have come from? Would that be impolite? Would that be looking a gift horse in the mouth? Or should he ask what they do for fun? They don't look like they'd want to play football, staining their materials, which has somehow stayed clean through that bush passage. But maybe he shouldn't presume. Are they similar to pets he has to feed? He finally speaks up. Can I offer you biscuits and water? The red Ashoke masquerade bends forward, cloth rippling like a wave, then straightens. This voice is soft too, but more slippery, silkier than the feathered masquerades. Palm oil, the masquerade says from behind its silver mask. You want palm oil? Yes, it says, the uh, S slinking out, drawing long, only palm oil. Polly's, Polly's mother arrives from her same stress job in the middle of this conversation. Oh, she says when she steps into the room, lugging bags of vegetables and fish for dinner in one hand and bolts of fabric in the other. She stands there for a long moment, looking at the masquerades, her body not quite in or out. Oh, she repeats, we have company? These are my masquerades, Polly announces. He stands tall, all of his 10-year-old height. He spreads his hands toward them as if they are an art project of his making. He waits for his mother to be impressed. But she says nothing, just enters the family living room, fully shutting the door with her foot. She walks past them to the kitchen and dumps her purchases on the counter. She's in there for a few minutes while Polly squints at his masquerades wondering if their sparkle has somehow muted, wondering how she's not standing beside him in all of those shades and textures. She reappears at the door to the kitchen holding a knife. Does this mean I have to make dinner for five? No, Polly answers, happy not to add to her troubles. They only eat palm oil. Good, his mother says, returning into the relative darkness of the kitchen. Good, his mother repeats, because I'm tired. Polly's cousins want to know what the masquerades can do. They stand really close to the softly moving figures in their backyard, football suspended. The boys reach fingers out to touch Polly's masquerades, but withdraw within inches of actual contact. I don't think they need to do anything, Polly responds, annoyed that the boys cannot just glory in the glistening of the beads, the luster of the raffia, the vibrancy of the feathers. They're masquerades. That first night had been weird, having the masquerades in his room, stuck in the corner with all his action figures and Lego. But after he had startled awake several times, the rustling of the first masquerade raffia began to soothe him. The moon snuck in through a gap in his curtains and passed through the beads on the ashoke and the reflected, refracted light dotting the walls and ceiling of Polly's room with stars. The embroidered, embroidered patterns on the third masquerade skirt seemed to him like complete stories in a secret language known only to him, the silver threads glinting alive in the night. Geez, calm down, Ekene says now, walking away from Polly and his masquerade. They're cool and all, but if they're just going to stand there, whatever, Polly says. He doesn't need to be there with his cousins when he has three masquerades. I'm going home, he announces. The masquerades glide behind him as if backing his decision. On the streets, Polly kicks pebbles. 
The masquerades are quiet now and he regrets leaving his cousins. But is there anything you can do? He turns to ask. At first, he's sure they are ignoring him. But then the red Asho King masquerade does a wavy thing again, silver head bowing down then lifting up. The raffia masquerade hops and spins around on the spot. The feathers on the third masquerade rise like a bird getting ready for flight. The feathers stick out in their million directions and Polly steps back. The masquerades dance. Out in the street, they twirl and contort and somersault. Polly feels transformed, transported to another world, a brighter one than his summer holiday has given him so far, more radiant than the heady rush of scoring a goal against Ekene. The masquerades faint left, then jerk right. They jump and fold and twist and spasm, and feathers flutter and clocks flap and billow and beads clink and jangle. And the plumes blur and raffia palms create a shh wind that is the background pulse of their dance. Thank you. Thank you for that reading, Bemi. Masquerade is an uncanny story where readers can glory in its glistening and the luster of its language and the vibrancy of its imagery and prose.